episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar on Jungian archetypes and respecting diversity. I couldn't figure out really exactly what to call this, but it's, um, I wanted to take a look at the Jungian archetypes and some of Carl Jung's theory as we go into um, his uh, perspective on personality and the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs and the Kiersey are largely based on a lot of Jung's work. So understanding kind of where that came from can help you understand why they think personality is more of an enduring sort of innate concept. And then we're going to talk about the different um, personality types um, and what we can do in order to help each personality type thrive, because um, each one has its own little idiosyncrasies. and you know, what problems we might look for as far as um, ways we can help people in counseling in a way that is consistent with how they learn and their, their temperament and personality. So we're going to define archetypes, explore where they come from, learn about each of the main four archetypes and how to best serve them in counseling. Um, we're going to talk about the collective unconscious. We'll explore the type or personality type and archetype connection. And then we'll define each personality type and potential stuck points and what we can do to help people. So the collective unconscious, if, you've, if you're a science fiction buff like me, you kind of think of the Borg, um, which is sort of what he was referring to. Archetypes are innate, universal, and hereditary and function to organize how we experience certain, certain things. They are in the collective unconscious, which Jung really believed that the human mind retains fundamental unconscious aspects of our ancestors that serve as basic foundations of how to be human. If you remember your developmental counseling or developmental psychology course from undergraduate, you know, there are certain things that infants are afraid to do from jump. They don't understand them. They have sort of this knowledge, some basic fears here and there. They have some basic responses. Now, so they have something that they're drawing from somewhere in order to know that you don't crawl off the edge of a table or you don't crawl onto what you think would be the edge of a table. Um, so the question started to arise, where does some of this knowledge come from? We, Jung didn't believe that infants were born as a blank slate or tabula rasa. He believed that they had some concepts already in their, in their brain. Now, they could be very primitive functions and when we talk about the fight or flight reaction when we talk about our um sort of automatic responses for survival a lot of those are based on things that you know we may not have encountered before so you're wondering well where did that fear come from or where did that response come from jung's philosophy or or he postulated that it came from that collective unconscious those stored memories that help us continue to survive and be human Archetypes symbolize basic human motivations, values, and personalities. You have four main ones that he talked about. The persona, the shadow, the self, and the anima or animus. And we're going to define those in a second. Each archetype plays a role in personality, but most people are dominated by one specific archetype. Of um, Freud's ego, id, and superego a little bit, and um, I'm just kind of warning you, it's all psychoanalytic in there. The actual way in which an archetype is expressed or realized depends on an individual's cultural influences and unique personal experiences. So we've got some information in there, but then based on what we learn from the outside environment, we put it together with the information that we have, and we come up with who we should be. We come up with what's a um, unacceptable urge. We come up with how do we integrate this to be ourself. So the persona is derived from the Latin word for mask, and it's how we present ourselves to the world. It represents all of the various social masks that we wear among various groups and situations like mother, sister, boss, counselor, you know, whatever they are. This social mask 
contains all of the primitive urges, impulses, and emotions that aren't considered socially acceptable in each situation. So as a CEO, you know, I know that coming to work, it's generally expected I'm not going to show up in my bathing suit and, you know, drunk off my keister. That would be an unacceptable behavior and impulse. Um, so the social mask tells me this, if you're going to be a CEO, if you're going to be a teacher, this is how you are expected to behave. Becoming too closely identified with this archetype can lead people to lose sight of their true selves, though. So if people really latch on to one um, persona, one mask, they may lose different aspects of themselves and they may lose touch with some of those other urges that need to be addressed. Uh, so it's important for us to have people look at themselves as a whole. They're not just a mother. They're not just a daughter. Um, they are multiple different personas and what does that look like for them? And how do those combine? You know, can you be a mother and a CEO? Can you be, um, whatever the, your different personas are at the same time. The shadow is an archetype that consists of the sex and life instincts composed of repressed ideas, weaknesses, desires, instincts, and shortcomings. So you take all the stuff that the, the persona says is not okay, and you shove it down into the shadows. You shove it down into the dark side. Um, the shadow forms out of our attempts to adapt to cultural norms and expectations. Well, what happens when we shove stuff down without addressing it or dealing with it? Generally, it comes back out later in some other form that's usually not helpful either, especially if we're talking about weaknesses and desires and instincts. Some of those things we may need to get met. We just have to figure out a way to meet them in a way that doesn't conflict with our persona, which we'll get to the self in a minute. Yes, like, like defense mechanisms. Um, so one of um, uh, Freud's defense mechanisms was sublimation. You suppress something that's unacceptable and use it for something that is more acceptable. It comes out of, instead of using your rage to put your fist through the wall, you can use your rage to fuel a um, campaign against something. Um, it's this archetype that contains all of the things that are unacceptable, not only to society, but also to one's own personal morals and values. There are things that we think of and we're like, you know, you know let's take drug use, for example. You know, if you are against drug use, and, but you see people doing it and you're like, I wonder what that's like. You know, the experimentation, think back to when you're a teenager. Teenagers want to experiment with everything. Um, so taking that and saying, well, that doesn't conflict with me being an honor student and everything, or that doesn't work with me being an honor student and everything else. So I'm going to push that down into the shadows. But there may be a, still a part of you that hangs on to this notion that you see other people using drugs and feeling okay. So how do you deal with that? Well, right now in the shadow, you've just shoved it down. So you know what you should be, you know what you shouldn't be, and you know how I feel about those two words. Then you have the anima and animus, and we're going to get to the self in a minute. The anima is the feminine image in the male psyche. The animus is the male image in the female psyche. These represent the true self rather than the image we present to others. So it's how we combine our masculine and feminine aspects. The collective unconscious may contain notions about how women or men should behave, but personal experience contributes to more personal images. So again, we take that stuff, you know, think intergenerational. What my mom thought was acceptable for a female was different than what her mom thought was acceptable for a female, which was different than her mom thought was acceptable for a female. But there were all notions about how a female should behave. And where did those come from? A lot of it is socially, and archetypes are very affected by social mores. So, you know, henceforth and forevermore, what little girls will potentially perceive as how a woman should behave could be affected in that collective unconscious or could be informed by what we add to that collective unconscious now. Um, Jung suggested that discouragement of people exploring their alternate gender aspects serves to undermine psychological development. If you say you can't have any of those feminine desires or feminine ideas or masculine, then we really stunt people. You know, my, 
when I grew up, I was, I was a tomboy half the time and I wore patent leather shoes the other half the time. You know, it was just kind of what parent I was with and what I was doing. But I was perfectly happy, you know, going out fishing with my dad as going to violin recitals. So I was able to explore both of those aspects and figure out what worked for me. And I think we find that with a lot of our clients, the ones who feel the most balanced and grounded, if you will, and sure of themselves, have had an opportunity to explore, you know, what is it that you like? What is it that you enjoy doing? And have been able to get past some of the social influences that say that boys shouldn't do this or girls shouldn't do that. So I think Jung was on to a, an idea here. Now, a lot of the early psychoanalysts, I, I look at the stuff that they put out and they have a a lot of information in them and a lot of truth in them, but their semantics leave something to be desired sometimes. So if you can separate yourself from the somewhat misogynistic, sexist semantics of psycho psychoanalysis, there are some things that seem to be very um, uh, true and have been true kind of throughout the ages. So now the self, I kept promising you. This is an archetype that represents the unified unconscious and consciousness of the individual. You're taking everything that is from that collective unconscious. We've informed it with our conscious, you know, taking in information and going, this is how things are now. Um, and the self is putting all this together and saying, okay, this is how I should be. These are some of my desires, what I want. And I can kind of make them mesh together in a way that works for me and I become my true self. This is called individuation. Um, it helps you know um, basically who you are as a person. Creating the self occurs through a process and in which the various aspects of the personality, those four archetypes, are sort of integrated. Now, Jung said that there were bunches, um, many, many archetypes. And let's see, I'll just pull this over here real quick. Maybe? Yeah. So there are other archetypes. As far as counseling is concerned, I didn't think it was germane to really go down all of these because there were so many. Um, but it's interesting to look at the different um, aspects or roles. If you want to think of an archetype as a role that people may take on and encourage people to look and see, say which ones of these might fit them and do they want to hold on to that or do they want to push it back down into the shadows or figure out a way to integrate it whoops young proposed three fundamental innate dichotomous ways by which individuals take in information and make decisions in order to achieve individuation so in order to make sense of all this take the collective unconscious and the stuff from out there, how do we take in the information and make sense of it to come to an understanding of ourself? Um, and uh, what they said was, and this is, you know, going to start sounding more like the MBTI and, and the Kiersey, that these dichotomous ways, it's what people will prefer one pole or over the other, but they tend to be somewhere kind of in the middle. They're not going to be for the most part, on one pole extreme or the other most of the time. He wrote that what appears to be random behavior is actually the result of differences in the way people prefer to use their mental capacities. Ah, so that's where it becomes important to counseling. We want people to adjust the way they're thinking, adjust the way they're reacting, adjust their concept of self, if you will, which in most you know you can think of it as a concept of language and a way of thinking about themselves well if we want them to do that we need to present the stuff in a way that they prefer to use their mental capacity so it makes sense to them and and meets their needs now Jung said that there were cardinal orientations the two that he identified early on were judging and perceiving judging preferring order and schedules and lists and perceiving being more spontaneous. Now, these carried on to the Myers-Briggs later. And introversion, being more energized by the internal world and what's going on in your own head and your own thoughts, um, and very aware of what's going on internally. And the external world, being aware of what's going on out there and energized by the outside world. 
Now, Jung used these different terms than you will see in the Myers-Briggs for the different personality types, um, caregiver, lover, jester, outlaw. Um, but he was leaning towards the same concepts that we're going to talk about. He said that type is more descriptive of how we behave. So our personality type is more descriptive of how we behave. Archetypes are more concerned with the forces that motivate our functioning. So the archetypes are the ones that are saying this should happen. And our personality type is how we kind of try to make it happen. People who share type preferences perceive and judge in similar ways, regardless of their countries of origin. So they found that there's an enduring character, regardless of um, cultural influences, for people who are, for example, extroverts versus introverts. And like I said, archetypes are influenced by a person's culture, setting, and time in history. So what was considered an ex acceptable impulses back in the 1890s is probably not the same as what's considered acceptable impulses and behaviors in 2017. So as we add information to this collective unconscious, those archetypes change. So I quickly went over and took the Jungian Myers-Briggs personality type, um, and it's, you know, obviously a combination of those. Um, Myers-Briggs added the fourth dimension, which was um, thinking and feeling, but that's sort of irrelevant. You can go to personalitytesting.info slash tests, this link here, and take your own version. You can also take one that is based on the Kiersey for free on um, kiersey.com, I think. Dot com or dot org. Um, but it gives you an idea of you're still getting the same sort of Myers-Briggs looking report that comes out. So what, why is that important? Why might we have a client take this? Well, partly to get some information about them and how they get energy. Um, guardians derive their energy from the outside world. So they're um, extroverts. Anytime you see that E, they're going to get their energy from the outside world, and they're probably more aware of what's going on outside and around them. They don't get drained by it, though. They actually, like, get energy. They kind of draw off of it. They tend to be supervisors, are good at making schedules, agendas, and inventories, and provide tried and true ways of doing things over speculation and experimentation. They, they want to do it the right way, the just way, the factual way. And they judge others in terms of compliance with and respect for schedules and procedures, which is kind of why they're called a supervisor, because they like routine, and, but they also like being around other people. Now, some challenges that they may have that, they may, that may end up causing them anxiety or distress that brings them to counseling is difficulty respecting the rights of others and having difficulty when others don't respect their rights. So the rights of others to say, I don't want to do this. The rights of others to act in a way that is contrary to the policies and procedures. And, you know, sometimes you look at it, you step back and you look at it, you know, you say, you know, you're right. That needs to be adjusted. But ESTJs have difficulty with that. They are very by the book kind of people. And when people don't respect their rights or respect their rules, they have difficulty handling it. It's just, it's not the way it's supposed to be. So one of the things as clinicians we can do is help people take that step back and start taking, learning how to take the other person's perspective. Whether they're, the, whether the other person has a different take on things so they can understand what's going on and see if something needs to be adjusted or understand why someone may not have respected Um, so we would have to step back and look at, well, what is the overarching reason for this rule? And that was one of the things that I always told my staff was when somebody asks you, why do we have to do this? The word is, or the response is not because I said so, because that's only going to get a grievance filed on you. You want to know, understand why we have each one of these rules. And if you don't, ask management because it's important for them to um, – be able to understand the whys of everything if we're going to enforce this rule. 
Uh, ESTJs also have overt directness and willing to speak up, which can cause interpersonal problems. Um, the challenge here is to help the supervisor navigate um, constructive feedback and, and constructive criticism, if you will, and speaking up in a meeting, maybe, and when is the appropriate time to do it, when can... Um, when can you better handle interpersonal problems? And how can you do it in a way that's not quite so forceful and overtly direct, overtly direct in a way that people are going to feel like they're being attacked? So working on those communication skills can be really important for the ESTJ supervisor. Um, they also have a strong goal orientation, which may cause them to not let anyone or anything, including new information, come between them and their goals. So the ESTJ may get a thought in their mind, and they are like a freight train with it going forward. And it doesn't matter what you say if you start saying, you know, we may need to st step back and think about this. They are that freight train going forward. Nothing's going to stop them, which can cause them to make mistakes. It can cause them to fail. It can cause them to have unintended consequences. Um, so encouraging them to learn how to practice the pause. If new information comes in and be able to kind of at least put the brakes on that freight train and slow down for a second to hear what's being said or take in this new information in a way that's meaningful in order to um, uh, prevent them from having problems and also help them best achieve their goals. So this goal orientation has to be balanced with kind of the overarching where are you going with this what is your overall goal what is your overall hope the inspectors get their energy from the inside world they enjoy traditions and family but get overwhelmed if the occasion gets too fancy or large so this is the introvert side where they prefer to have a couple of really good friends and small get-togethers they'll get overwhelmed in large large meetings they prefer small home groups they prefer if they're going to do therapy groups you know five or six people as opposed to 12 or 15. Um, they can get really overwhelmed easily in residential settings or if there's a lot of activity going on in your facility. They are often more aware of what's going on inside them and they're detail-oriented, they're responsible, report irregularities, but they're often misjudged for not caring. These are your, even more than the um, ESTJs, who tend to like to manage people, your ISTJs tend to be your auditor types. And they are the ones who will come in. They'll be like, the book says this. It's not this way. So I'm marking it off. N end of discussion. Um, and it's not that they don't care. They're just less aware of what's going on with the people around them and the possible reasons for what's going on. So they may be a little bit too um, analytical, which is something we can help them work on in counseling if they feel like people say that they're completely emotionless and uncaring let's look at where that's coming from it can be from their highly de developed sense of responsibility and need to make sure that everything's perfect um, that they can lose the human element in in what they're talking about and that also comes from the t aspect the thinking they are more driven by fairness and rules and justice than compassion and um, the human element. They always honor the commi their commitments and often go above and beyond no matter the cost. This can be another issue for people because um, in relationships, you know, they may feel like they get taken advantage of because they always go above and beyond and put themselves in jeopardy and they kind of take on a martyr tone here and nobody does the same for them or most other people don't do the same for them. So they can feel like they get taken advantage of, they can feel um, unappreciated. So we wanna look at, are they over committing? Are they going above and beyond too much? And what is healthy, you know? Sometimes it's nice to go above and beyond a little bit, but if you go above and beyond to the extent that it's impacting, negatively impacting your work and your family, well, is that what you're really working towards, you know, in a rich and meaningful life, if you will? So encouraging them, yeah, honoring commitments is great. That's 
love the loyalty and and people respect that however if you get to the point where when you make commitments you make people feel guilty for asking you or you feel bad or taken advantage of then that's working against you so let's look at how you can navigate this boundary disorganization or unpredictability often causes anxiety and acting out remember I said they like it like it by the book they like their checklists tend to be if you want to think auditor that's what I think of more than inspector um, and, and very uh, unwavering so life is unpredictable <laughs> unfortunately life can be disorganized which can cause a lot of anxiety in people if they don't know what's going to happen next or if a supervisor retires they don't know who the next person is there's some unpredictability helping clients develop distress tolerance tools to handle the unpredictability and the disorganization remember one of our basic fears is loss of control so helping people look at um, what they're doing when something happens when they start to get anxious you know is there an element of disorganization or unpredictability and what can they do about that um, these kinds of clients also really struggle with not knowing exactly what the plan is in sessions uh, that's true and so for that um, and one of the ways I start a lot of my sessions because I tend to be more of a um, judger structured type of person I start out each session they know that we're going to review the homework I'm going to ask them how the week went and then I'll tell them what kind of topic we're going to go over at the beginning you know I'll start out by saying well let's last week we were talking about this a lot let's continue following that path um, I also will use their treatment plan for people who are really ISTJ um, I will use their treatment plan to identify specific goals that we're going to cover in session um, next week so they know what to be thinking about so when they get to when they get to session they already know kind of what the game plan is and then if we have to drop back and punt because life happened we can uh, but it gives them a little bit more sense of control um, I can also in some cases let them look at the treatment plan and choose where they need to go from that um, ISTJs find negative emotions particularly unacceptable they don't know how to deal with it they're not emotional people they tend to be very calm um, they are intense don't get me wrong they're not unemotional but they don't know how to deal with those feeling words anger fear sadness Ugh, it feels icky to them so helping them develop an emotional vocabulary that works for them if they don't like anger when they feel angry what is it like help them create a um, metaphor or something they can use to express how they're feeling to identify how they're feeling and figure out how to deal with it what does anger mean to them and what's a way that they can deal with it they like the lists they like the checklist they like the routine so let's develop a routine when you get angry what's the first thing you need to do what's the second thing you need to do let's write it down um, and that helps them feel more in control of what's going on because they've got a plan now they also have difficulty understanding behaviors that differ from their own so people who are highly emotional um, my husband is very much an is well, he's an ISTP but very strong on the introverted scale very much a thinker until we met wasn't real comfortable with dealing with emotions and feeling words and stuff it just kind of freaked him out um, and this can be said for a lot of people not just guys but you know people who are tend to be on the T side of the TF dimension helping them understand what emotions mean so they're not overwhelmed by them they're not scared by them help them understand um, how some people may prefer to be spontaneous you know that's one I still have a hard time wrapping my head around because I'm pretty polar on the J um, so understanding how people can wake up on a Saturday morning and go hey it's a nice day let's go to Disney World I'm like well, no 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 that wasn't the schedule that's not what we had planned um, helping the ISTJ 
step back from their manual of how things are supposed to be and start to appreciate individual differences and look at how that makes that person unique and awesome and how they can to use the word from the seven habits how they can synergize instead of having to have everybody be carbon copies of themselves and predictable the esfj the extrovert side they like being around people they gather that energy the f is they're really motivated by wanting people to um by, by compassion and wanting people to get along uh, the j is the kind of structured part peer relationships are extremely important they like work that produces practical results though they don't like just doing something on a whim and that's the the sensing part is you're more detail oriented so they don't want to be talking about meta concepts in counseling they want something that's practical so if we're going to give them homework let's tell them why they're doing it how it's going to help them and then give them an activity or something to do that will produce a practical result maybe it will help them um, reduce their distress from a four to a three when they get anxious um, think about it in a more scientific sort of way they are caring sympathetic and warm-hearted that goes with the feeling aspect and they respect authority and structure which is good because we kind of represent authority and structure so that gives us sort of an upper hand in this um, relationship as far as guiding where we're going but it can also be a downside if we're trying to get a real collegial balanced relationship because they will they may tend to defer to us more they have difficulty getting work done because they're so involved in helping others um, you know they can want they can reach out they can help other people do their paperwork they can cover for people and then all of a sudden they're like oh criminy i still have a bunch of my stuff that i haven't started doing yet um so then they start to get overwhelmed and may feel resentful and then they may get angry at themselves for i'm not going to do this anymore we've all dealt with clients who have this issue time management helping them set boundaries you know recognize why are they so involved in helping others there's wanting to help people and then there's needing that external validation so as clinicians we want to say is there a um, self-esteem component and a boundary component to this or is it more time management and then help them start setting those time management goals or boundaries so they can help others and they can get meaning from that because you know feelers and and guardian providers really derive a lot of joy from helping others so saying you need to back off from helping people isn't going to work in their favor you know this is one of the things that it brings meaning to their life so we want to figure out how they can do that without wearing themselves down and messing up on their own stuff they have high anxiety to perceived unfairness to themselves or anybody else if somebody else gets passed over for a promotion or if their best friend's boyfriend cheats on them um, they will get incensed i mean it's, it's not just a little bit irritated like oh they will get incensed so helping them develop again distress tolerance skills become aware of the fact that you know they are about fairness um, and and so when they perceive something is unfair how can they handle that help them see that fairness is a trigger for their anxiety or their anger um, the over commitment increases their anxiety so remember i talked a minute ago about time management and boundaries well their over commitment here it comes from if i don't do it nobody will and you know if you've had kids uh, you probably have felt that way sometimes about making dinner or taking out the trash or whatever else so you may do it yourself because it's just easier instead of having to argue with somebody to get it done but this increases anxiety and resentment and irritability and is it really helping the other person to do it for them so again having them look at these things that are causing you distress is it helping you live a rich and meaningful life and is it achieving your goal if you want to help somebody are you really helping them by doing stuff for them um, giving directions is unappealing so they expect mind reading and then when others fail to read their mind they get angry and disappointed that goes along a little bit with the 
F with the feeling part, they don't want to tell people what to do. They want everybody to be happy. They don't want to be seen as an ogre. So they may just hint about things. And then when people don't pick up on the hint, you know, it's, it's a cascade of, well, see, I told you if I didn't do it, nobody would. Well, did you ask anybody to do it? So we want to look at their communication skills. We want to look, again, at self-esteem. Do they have issues with asking people to do things or give direction because they're afraid of rejection or because they don't have the assertiveness skills to do so? Um, and they may get taken advantage of to preserve relationships because they want to help other people so much. Um, some people may, may pick up on this and say, oh, she's always around to help me. So whenever I need something, I can just call on her. I don't really have to do anything. She's always going to be there or he's always going to be there. So we want to encourage relation, teach relationship skills and have people look at the health of their relationships, making sure that it's a relatively equal give and take over the long haul. The ISFJs, or the protectors, are considerate, dedicated, service-minded, and quiet. They work well independently, observe what needs to be done, and do it without discussion. So if you have employees like this, you love it because you don't have to go around and micromanage and go, well, okay, that still needs to be done and that still needs to be done. Same thing with kids. Um, you know, if they can look around and go, oh, well, the trash needs to be taken out and they do it without having to ask about it or get a lot of direction, you're like, oh, that's so awesome. Um, so your ISFJs tend to have a good relationship with other people because they're not having to be micromanaged. Their friendships are very important, but not as important as respect for authority. So they are balancing this whole um, feeling thing, this need for compassion and everybody getting along with the additional need for structure and authority. And they're like, okay, I want everybody to get along, but we got to go by some rules here. They like things narrowly and completely defined to ensure meet, meeting other people's expectations. So if you're giving an ISFJ a task, you know, you're writing the treatment plan, and this can really work to our advantage because these are actually the best treatment plans, where you've got an overarching goal, and then you've got a sub-goal, and then you've got maybe interventions to help them meet that sub-goal, and then you've got another sub-goal. They love this. It's not too detailed for them. It's perfect because they know exactly what they're supposed to do in order to um, achieve the, the treatment plan goal. Often feel personally responsible for the behavior of those around them, which causes a lot of worry. Think about job situations you've been in before. If somebody's not doing what they're um, supposed to be doing, people may get really nervous and anxious. Um, when, I know when we had auditors, we used to have auditors come in, people would worry, start worrying about what didn't get done. And I'm like, well, we should have worried about that before, but whatever. Uh, they have a hard time setting boundaries and saying, you know, I am going to do the best I can and I can't control what John, Jane, and Jose over there are doing. It's just, I have, to, I can only be responsible for me and do the best I can. They may complain that they have too much to do but not know how to ask for help. So as opposed to the um, last one who expected mind reading, the ISFJ will complain that there's too much to do and that they complain a lot, which is alienating sometimes. So we may end up seeing clients because they feel like nobody likes them. Well, let's look at why. You know, what, what do you think alienates people from you and we may find that they have difficulty with communication skills difficulty asking for help they want everybody to be happy they want everybody to get along um, so they have a hard time reaching out and they need regular quiet time to get grounded since they're responsible or they feel responsible for other people's boundaries and um they want everybody to get along. It can be very overwhelming for the introvert, the I, who needs time to their own thoughts. Introverts will always need a little bit of time each day to get grounded, or they're going to start to get irritable. The artisan promoter is the ESTP. They're active, energetic, versatile, sociable, and highly competitive. 
they may avoid trying things they don't think they can win though so you may have clients who have been tr depressed or anxious for a long time who've never come to treatment because they tried to fix it on their own and it didn't help so now they don't think therapy will help at all so they don't even want to try um they may avoid trying things in their own life you know people want to achieve goals and they may be afraid to you know get out of that comfort zone if they're not sure they can win so we may want to work on some self-esteem and some encouragement skills and help them figure out how they deal with failure they typically do what pragmatically solves the immediate problem the problem with that now think about um, acceptance and commitment therapy we can react to something and get into this autopilot of whenever this happens I do XYZ well if that autopilot reaction is unhelpful then our immediate way of solving the problem our immediate way of making the stress or pain go away like going to the bar and having a few drinks that may not be helpful in our long-term goals so the ESTP may need help practicing the pause and saying okay this is the immediate problem there are several ways to pragmatically solve it however which one is going to help me meet my larger goals and help me move towards those things that are important to me um, so teaching distress tolerance as well as stopping to think how can i do this in a way that moves me closer to my goals instead of just what's going to make it go away the most efficiently right now and they seize the day these the p the the perceiver is the more spontaneous of the time management styles they prefer kinesthetic learning and they're sensitive to confinement so in counseling they will do really well with role plays whether individual or in group and experiments so if you give them um, some sort of homework activity and say try this i do a coin toss activity and i say toss the coin uh, if it lands on heads pretend that you are happy you know your problems are gone you're not depressed anymore act like it's a great day if it lands on tails you don't have to change anything just be your normal self and tell me at the end of each day i want you to write a journal and when we come back together i want you to tell me if anything was different on the days that you had to act happy um, so those are ways that you can really get the buy-in with the art artisan promotion promoters they often ignore authority with the idea that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission um, these are the clients who may monkey with their meds without talking to their psychiatrist first um, and they also may end up causing themselves interpersonal difficulties at work and at home because they do things knowing full well it's probably going to cause problems but it's easier to ask for forgiveness so working on relationship skills boundaries and delaying gratification can help they thrive on attention from others they're a promoter think you know band promoter so it's important that they're getting feedback and they're getting that social input if they don't have a social outlet in their life that it's going to be really important for us to help them bring back in because they're competitive with themselves but they also draw energy from being competitive with other people if they can do it in a good way then it can in increase their energy and make them feel you know empowered they may present as hyperactive and, and impulsive because they're so active and energetic and competitive they're just like okay you want to do that let's try it it's on they may say hurtful things in order to create excitement so if you're running into clients who seem to always be putting their foot in their mouth or in group they tend to say things that seem like they were actually intended to kind of stir the pot a little bit we might want to look at what's the benefit to that the promoter really needs a lot of stimulation they need stuff going on in their life they need to be around other people or they're going to get bored so it's important to help them understand that so they can integrate that into their life you know social activities hobbies clubs groups they need to be challenged to take risks in constructive ways so again if they're bored and they've got a lot of energy they may just act out just to get the excitement going if they have maybe they're part of a kayaking group or a rock climbing group or whatever it is 
that can challenge them in a constructive way. They don't respond well to delayed gratification. You know, if you work hard all week long and keep your, keep your nose down, then on Saturday you can go out. They may need some injection of excitement in between. So we want to have... Um, uh, we want to have them take a look at this. And yeah, this can be, um, this can seem a lot like ADHD sort of um, uh, temperament or characteristics when you start looking at the promoter type of temperament. So again, I would encourage you before we start slapping labels on things to look at, is this person ADHD or is this their temperament? Or does it really matter? What we're dealing with is somebody who needs excitement, who probably needs some organizational and time management skills, and may need some to address some self-esteem issues um, in order to not have to always have attention from other people. The crafter is a calm observer. They tend to be independent loners, and that's in a good way. They're people who can sit you know all day saturday on a rainy day and crochet and watch netflix movies and be perfectly happy compelling need to know how things work you know it's not just you know whatever if i can figure it out that's great these are the people who if they get something in their mind like when i started raising um angora rabbits to make yarn um i needed to know everything about angora rabbits i needed to know how they were bred i needed to know you know, how to treat them, how to spin the yarn. I needed everything about it. So I ordered, my husband always laughs. He knows when I'm on a new hobby because I'll order like 30 books from Amazon. Because um, I want to know everything about it and how it works. With counseling, we don't, with ISTPs, we don't want to just tell them to do something. We want to tell them, you know, explain the theory underlying it. How is this intervention supposed to help them feel better? This will really help increase their motivation. If we don't, they may be stubborn because they may not see any point to doing it. Journaling is one example. I am not a journaler, never have been, and I can explain the benefits of journaling to people, but I've also found alternate ways of self-expression that aren't necessarily prose journaling. Um, but it's important for them to understand how you think this can help them achieve their goals. They are masters of improvisation. That's the perceiver in there. They're, they're not real rigid. So they may procrastinate too much for tasks they abhor. So time management is going to be really important to helping them be successful and prevent distress. They'll often put up with whatever goes on, on around them until they can't stand it anymore, and then they'll explode. You know, we know people like this, and we've probably worked with people like this. So helping them become more aware, you know, they're introverted so they're aware of what's going on inside them but encouraging them when they notice it now what do you do with it you can tell this is irritating you what do you do instead of shoving it down until you explode like a nuclear bomb um, interpersonal skills problem solving skills communication skills it's going to depend on the client they have difficulty sharing what's going on inside Encouraging them to develop that emotional vocabulary or that feeling vocabulary in a way that's meaningful for them. So if they're feeling antsy, they can say that. You know, anxious may not be a word they like. Antsy, um, stifled, all those words work. But encourage them to start describing to you in each session what's going on inside you right now. How are you actually feeling? Um, and encourage them to start using mindfulness to become more aware of you know more attuned if you will they're aware of it but they need to actually stop and take notice and go okay this is how i'm feeling and write down what's going on inside them a couple times a day so they get used to identifying it and then we can take that a step further to communicating it to others to get your needs met the, the artisan performers are extremely optimistic value social fun unhindered by standards and encouraged others to be themselves. Performer fits pretty well. They are the um, free spirits. They thrive on being the center of attention, value themselves based on whom they make happy. Now, I, I think just reading that sentence, you can probably see where this can cause anxiety and distress for people. If they're not able to make 
certain people happy that they really are determined to make happy, it can take a huge hit on their self, self-esteem and their self-worth. So we want to encourage them to look at how they value themselves for the fact that they can make people happy, not just on who they make happy. You can't control how other people feel. They are flexible and adaptable um, and tend to respond to fights with humor and may forgive easily, may t- maybe too easily, because they want everybody to get along. They want everybody to be happy. They want to make people happy. And above all, they don't want to make people unhappy. So they may just kind of sweep things under the rug. So we can see, again, some distress building up and resentment and irritability and feeling taken advantage of if they forgive too easily. So working with boundaries and setting um, setting limits and communicating their needs. They are especially vulnerable to peer pressure and take on characteristics of their friends. Um, being aware of this, your ESFPs that are in, in high school, but even adults when they join a new group may be vulnerable to, to peer pressure. So what is this group doing for you? Is it helping? Is it hurting? Um, and in what way can you, is it helping you meet your needs? They dislike theoretical and prefer practical, generalizable skills. So they don't want to go with the, this is the sensing part. Uh, They like details. They want skills that they can use, but they can use not just when they get angry or not just in this one little slice of a situation, but something that they can use every day, like mindfulness. Those are practical skills. We can talk about how it's beneficial to them. So help them see how the skills they're using in counseling to deal with a particular situation can be generalized and they can use it to help their kids deal with stress. They can use it to deal with stress at work. They can use it to deal with whatever else. Once they start seeing that generalizability, they're going to be like, okay, that's useful. The composers are easygoing, positive, cope well with change and get along with others. There's little desire to change other people, and they prefer to just observe. This is the introvert part. They're kind-hearted and may take the pain of others, which is important to know. So if they tend to be those people who, like the counselors that we'll find out, feel very deeply, it's important to make sure that they're also feeling happy things, and they're able to set appropriate boundaries and pull themselves out instead of being drowning with someone else who feels like they're drowning. The challenge with the composers is their minds tend to wander. They may disappear because of their quiet, unassuming manner. Um, they'll be kind of off in their own little own little world. And uh, they express themselves through action, not words, and can, can be indirect. So <clears throat> again, with communication skills and relationship skills, If somebody does something that makes them mad, they may decide, well, I'm not going to message them until they notice that I'm upset. And then when the person doesn't notice, they get their feelings hurt because they're like, well, why didn't they notice I was upset and come ask me about it? So we want to help them develop more assertive communication skills um, so they can be direct with other people expressing their needs and wants. Interestingly, um, they have a strong connection to nature. So a lot of ISFPs really enjoy going out on hikes and communing with nature. And I, that was just kind of a side note that I found in my research that I figured I'd put in there um, because they may find some meaningful, quiet time to get grounded out at a park. They love to read and write the introverted nature. They're, they're doing more introspection than, than your extroverts. They do find it difficult to predict the consequences of their behaviors, though. Um, So we need to help them make connections between, you know, if you sulk, you know, for example, going back to the indirect communication, if you sulk, what do you expect is going to be the outcome from that? And, you know, then what did happen? And are they the same or are they different? and, And why was your prediction potentially incorrect. The other interesting thing with ISFPs is they don't like to say no, which can be a self-esteem issue and a boundary issue, but it can just be wanting everybody to be happy. But they may frequently break commitments. So 
they can have a lot of hard feelings and difficulties in their social relationships and at work um, because they say yes to everything, but then at the last minute they go, oh, well, I can't, I can't do that. You know, never mind. Not going to be there. Not going to show up. So it's important for clients to look at what is causing the distress in their life and is there something that they can do or some a way they can learn they can change they can become a little more middle of the road or address some of these characteristics um, we're not saying that they have to be this way all the time but understanding what some of the weaknesses of their innate personality are um, can help people interface with others in a more effective way the teacher likes to help others and wants them to develop to their highest potential they lead by communicating a vision that appeals to everyone so it's not just a particular skill but it's like this year in english 101 we are going to learn this wonderful stuff and get everybody excited about coming to class so it's the meta concept if you will they have a desire to understand themselves and others but they need things settled and organized so think of it again a teacher where you're presenting a concept for a class or in counseling a treatment plan goal there's this big concept when you are happy when you are not depressed anymore what is this going to look like wow okay now in order to get there we need things settled and organized so what are the steps we need to take to get there so the teachers will be really good about developing treatment plans but they need like many others the reasoning behind things how is this going to help me move towards my goals they can be sensitive to criticism value conflicts and rejection um, especially if they've got low self-esteem so it's important for us to help them see um, that not everybody likes this big vision you know not everybody's going to like english 101 or your ver version of being undepressed <clears throat> but that's yours and that's okay because it's it's yours and encouraging them to own that and embrace their individuality um, help them figure out how to deal with other people who are um, different appreciate differences appreciate disagreements learn from them you know take what's useful and leave the rest is one thing that a saying that i use a lot of times because sometimes people will have an opinion and it's very valid but it doesn't work with my thing so you know thanks for thanks for informing me but I'll keep doing it my way uh, they may start working on projects once they have the overarching idea without waiting for the details so they get this idea this overarching idea in their head and they start writing the treatment plan but they haven't done the sub goals yet and so they may get ahead of themselves when they're trying to figure out how to accomplish a goal they may jump the gun so they get a great idea then we have to say all right now let's stop and figure out what the next steps are lack of harmony in an environment causes them great distress and they may lie to preserve it um, my daughter just went through about a year ago this thing with her best friend who was her, would tell her that they were best friends but then would talk about this other girl and say that they were best friends and my daughter was like well how can we both be bestest best friends you can only have one bff and i'm oh wow making my head hurt um but for this particular young woman um her best friend was the best friend that was with her at the time um and and trying to help people understand this um but also the ENFJ may want everybody to think that they're their best friend because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. The INFJ is the counselor. We counselors uh, theoretically are compassionate, empathetic, and intense. We can be difficult to get to know, not sharing our innermost thoughts. We listen to everybody else's and we take in everybody else's and we're aware of our own but we may not put that out there um, so it's important to pay attention for ourselves and if we have any counselors who are INFJs that we it's important to share those innermost thoughts in order to get that interpersonal connection even if it's only with a couple of people INFJs love theoretical con conversations you know you can talk about psychoanalysis or cognitive behavioral or 
um, you know, anything theoretical. It doesn't have to be counseling oriented, but they like talking about meta concepts. We don't like to get too bogged down in the itty bitty details. Even when I'm writing treatment plans, you know, I have to force myself, you know, I like getting the big concept, but then the sub goals and the interventions, I know they need to go there and I can put them in there, but that's not my favorite part. I like talking about the meta concepts. But in order to make a meta concept happen, we have to have the steps to get there. So it's important to help people see how they relate. Um, INFJs de desire friendships, but our introversion prevents them from reaching out. So they desire a few friendships. They're not the ones that are going to be the social butterflies, that are going to be the president of their sororities or their fraternities. Um, but they will have a few really close friends. They often over-empathize and can become distraught by media. Um, and I'm using this for the general population. We can, as clinicians, um, our, our empathy, our intense empathy can cause us distress when we empathize with others and lead to burnout. But some of our clients who are, you know, watching the news all the time, and I use the example of Hurricane Katrina or 9-11, when people were constantly watching the media, and it just ripped their hearts out. They over-empathized, some of them, with the people who were directly in the path of, of the trauma. So we have to help people learn how to set boundaries of what's healthy. And, you know, yeah, news is important, media is important, but I also need to set limits. They dislike disorder in relationships, environments, or conversations. You know, I am not a neat freak, but I have piles and i have order to my chaos as i as i put it um but we like to have a general idea that everything's kind of going as it should may fail to participate in group discussions or meetings the introvert part says you know maybe i don't need to speak up right now and the feeling part may say well i don't want to irritate people with being contrary so they may feel like they get walked on or their ideas don't get heard or taken um taken advantage of they often interrupt and finish other people's sentences based on what they knew was coming next they're intuitive they pay attention they probably are um and and Yes, a lot of times when you don't speak up in group discussions and meetings because you don't want to make waves or maybe you don't think it's the appropriate time, people may think that you don't have anything to contribute. And so it's important for us to help our clients develop assertiveness skills so they can get their ideas out there um, in a way that they don't feel intimidated and they don't feel like they're hurting people's feelings, but they also feel heard. Um, the other itch issue interpersonally is to help them take a break even if you can guess what the person is going to say when they finish their sentence let them finish it so communication skills can be really important um, we most of us know somebody if it's not ourselves who you know all through high school or even right now they're very intuitive and the, everybody goes to them when they've got a problem and they tend to finish your sentences and think they know exactly what you're thinking and it can cause communication hiccups the champions are not comfortable with sitting still or downtime they can't wait to tell others of their extraordinary experiences i think of these as adventurers they have a strong desire to speak out on issues and they tend to be somewhat romantic and highly sympathetic so you have that feeling part people I want people to get along i am passionate about certain things and i've got a lot of energy that i just i derive from other people and i need to be around other people so they usually have multiple things going on at once and we all know what happens when you start juggling too many balls so the champion may have a bunch of causes that they're really um, concerned about but then they start getting too many balls up in the air and start failing to complete their own work um, because they've got too much stuff going on or they're helping too many other people um, they are constantly scanning the social environment so no intriguing silent motive is likely to escape their attention they tend to be overly perceptive maybe hyper vigilant in some cases um, so it's important to 
help them effectively interpret nonverbals, but also take on the perspective of, all right, this was my first interpretation. What are three other possible things that this could mean? You know, maybe it wasn't about me. We want to make sure they're not personalizing everything as, as an affront. They may annoy people by offering too much help and get to get their feelings hurt when they're told to back off. And, you know, best intentions, but and when they're offering things with their best intentions and they get told to back off, it can hurt. Oops, I've gone a little long. So I am going to um, speed up a little bit. The INFPs, like fantasy and daydreaming, they tend to be divergent thinkers and tend to be highly idealistic. They're impatient with too many details. If you have to go, you can go. I apologize for running late. Um, I'm going to finish. There's two more slides. Uh, they tend to be impatient with too many details. They may have unmet expectations of others and situations can lead to si feelings of despair and rejection. So we want to make sure that the healer is able to have realistic expectations of other people. Um, help them communicate their emotions effectively and make sure they have plenty of personal time and space so they can get grounded every day. The field marshal is cheerful, confident, and optimistic. They can be opinionated and dominate discussions which can, which can cause interpersonal problems. And they are strategic and goal-driven. They need to feel they're in control and not succumbing to the desire of others. So especially if you're working with them in counseling, we want them to write their own treatment plan. We want them to really participate in the plan development. Escalating power struggles are the most common problem for this particular personality because rejected ideas leads them to reject the rejector. So if they don't take criticism from people, they'd rather cut them off than take rejection. So interpersonal skills, problem solving, and perspective taking. Um, and they believe anybody can do anything they set their mind to, which goes back to helping them set realistic goals of what is and is not able to be accomplished and what's within their control. And the mastermind is autonomous, intricate thinker, in intellectual, independent, and self-confident. They always have contingency plans. Can, they have plan A, but they also have B, C, and D. So you know if you go hiking with them, you are not going to be left without toilet paper. Uh, they can get set on an idea and unaffected by external input. So they, they're another one of those freight trains, which leads them to have difficulty switching gears. They may get so focused on one thing, uh, doing a project, writing a grant, that they can't take a, take a break to go do group. Um, they may lose a sense of competence in one area and globalize it to every other area of their life. So it's important to look at, for this particular temperament, if something bad happens, what does that mean about them as a person? What does that mean about their other personas? They tend to excel at what they like and fail at what they dislike. So for me, for example, I love doing session, hate doing notes. So I excel at sessions and I struggle to do my notes. That, Respond well when interventions are concrete and presented in experiments, but they may be so internally driven that they forget that others need praise. So it's important to help them understand um, if they're having interpersonal problems that they need to look and, and give kudos to other people, even though they may not see the point. Inventors can spontaneously talk about just about anything and prefer to focus on systems and patterns. They tend to be generalists with an insatiable curiosity. They're constantly learning something new. They like learning facts and gaining tools and find it difficult to stay on task or deadline because they're always multitasking. They're learning this over here and that over here. I've got four different crochet projects going on at the house right now. Um, and, you know, just knowing that you've got multiple, again, balls in the air. This temperament needs autonomy. They need the ability to kind of spread their wings a little bit and figure out what's going to fit. They thrive on reinventing and improving upon everything. So you may give them a homework assignment, and if they say, eh, that's not going to work for me, you may say, okay, that's cool. Why don't you tell me, you know, how would you approach this situation um, or learning this tool that might work better for you? Or can you 
help me teach this in a slightly different or more effective way because it didn't seem like it really hit with you and their their eyes will probably light up if they get the opportunity to try to do that and figure out how to make work something work better they find discussion useful to clarify their thoughts they think while they talk and they often hide their negative feelings preferring positivity so again this is a group um, that whether it's an extroverts or feelers both um, dimensions tend to need to learn how to identify and effectively communicate their feelings and they may have lofty unrealistic goals so helping them back it down you can't change the world you may want to improve upon the way the entire company runs or you know you may want to change your husband or your or your wife but that's probably not real realistic what is one thing we can focus on that you can change so focusing on what is with within and beyond their capabilities to change the architect detached precise cognitive and reserved like to know a great deal about things they are the specialist they will take one thing and they will learn everything there is to know about it maybe to the expense of a lot of other stuff and they're very pragmatic they may fa fail to get complete projects getting lost in the process learning everything there is to know about you know doing a plumbing project they may get lost in YouTube videos for an entire weekend they find writing a useful way to clarif clarify their thoughts and may be so internally engaged that they have difficulty picking up on interpersonal cues and have poor social skills. So these are the people who are really technical and they're great at taking in super technical stuff and knowing everything about it. But because they're so in to that moment, they may have difficulty interpreting what's going on around them with the people around them. And they may drift off in conversations to explore logical connections. So you're talking about something and they just start, my son will do that. He'll start designing a battleship in his own mind. And I'm like, wait, come back. Come back here to this discussion. They can seem arrogant and may show impatience with others who have less ability or who are less driven because they are um, uh, specialists in that particular area. They may have a difficulty finding people who they can converse with on that particular topic and then they start to feel isolated so it's important we help them figure out outlets where they can talk to other people who share similar interests young's archetypes later informed his theory on personality types we have similar knowledge from a collective unconscious but our personality reflects how we choose to use it each personality type has its own strengths and challenges and attending to these can help us provide more individualized interventions and identify potential areas for prevention education. Again, I apologize for running long. I think this is the first time I've done it in a year and a half of doing these, so I had to screw up sometime. Um, but if uh, you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, send me a text, and. Um, you know, I will be certain to respond to that. And thank you, Kathy, for those book recommendations. I will add those to the class. If you enjoy this podcast, please like and subscribe either in your podcast player or on YouTube. You can attend and participate in our live webinars with Dr. Snipes by subscribing at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. This episode has been brought to you in part by allceus.com, providing 24-7 multimedia continuing education and pre-certification training to counselors, therapists, and nurses since 2006. Use coupon code counselor toolbox to get a 20% discount off your order this month.